two for you all coming out tonight. This is called Hometown Teams, How Sports Changed America. And this is not uh, a theme that, that the Delta Cultural Center developed, but actually it's a theme that was created and developed by the Smithsonian Institute. And basically all of the research and the whole theme of the exhibit deals with how uh, sports in, has impacted America. And I think most of us agree in one form or fashion we've all been um, affected or been impacted by sports. And so that's what this is tonight. We have several different people who come from different areas of sports who have made great contributions. And most of them here are, also have local ties and local affiliations. So that's what makes it, what makes it uh, even more uh, special. And so with that being said, let me explain how things are going to work tonight. Um, our uh, project coordinator, uh, education person, Richard Spielman, he's going to talk to you later. And he's going to uh, share with you the bios of each of the uh, distinguished guests. And then he's got a few questions that he's going to ask, just kind of like his conversation starters. But there's also a mic over here that's hot, right here. And so as you hear different things go forth by the panelists, you may have a question uh, that something you're interested in. And we strongly, strongly encourage you to, to present those questions, at which point in time you can just go to the mic um, and uh, wait to be acknowledged by Richard. And then you can ask your question, and then you can direct it to your panelists. When you do come up to the mic to introduce yourself, please uh, share who you are, where you're from, and then your question and who you're uh, presenting that question to. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Richard Spillman, our education director. All right, thank you, Kyle, and I'm really glad to have these four uh, great people here who are from this area and have done very important things in the world of sports here in Delta. And uh, like Kyle was saying earlier, we decided that we were uh, going to be uh, uh, having the symposium as a result of a, an exhibit that we had here. We all had a chance to see our new exhibit at Delta Cultural Center. It's up until October the 21st, and it's about hometown teams and how sports kind of involved with the community and how sports kind of change and how it affects the culture of the community as well. And so we have uh, all four of our guests today are from the Delta region, and all four of them make impacts in the world of sports and beyond. And so I'll give you a little bit of stories about each one of them. And I'll start off with uh, this gentleman here on the very far right, or my right, or your left. His name is Dr. Wilbur Gaines, and he's had a very long and prolific career in the field of sports. In high school, he played for the Helena Raymond's uh, Negro Baseball League and for the Eliza Miller Golden Buccaneers. Currently, he's the Emeritus uh, Associate Professor of Physical Education of the Arkansas State University. Gaines is also a member of the Arkansas Officiating Associated Hall of Fame. Uh, the lady next to him, her name is Miss Sonia Tate. Uh, she was born in Hughes, which is in St. Francis County. Uh, she played junior high basketball in West Memphis, where she was a starter on her varsity basketball team by the end of the 10th grade year. Tate was named newcomer of, or co-newcomer of the year in the American South Conference. She earned an All-American South Conference honors as a sophomore and All-Sun Bell Conference honors as a junior and senior. In college, she became one of the leading scorers in ASU history, including a 50-point outing against the University of Louisiana Lafayette during the 1992-93 season. Tate was also involved in other sports, including All-American and track, setting the world record in decathlon with 5,247 points. Tate later played for the American Basketball League the 96-97 and 97 98 season. She also uh, played a uh, season for the Minnesota Lynx, or a season, a partial season for the Minnesota Lynx with the women's NBA before leaving with knee injury. She was inducted into the Arkansas Sports Hall of Fame in 2013 and is currently a professor at uh, West Memphis University. Uh, the gentleman right next to her, and we'll keep going down the row, uh, Danny Cooperwood was a 1970s member of the Eliza Miller Golden Buccaneers. He earned a starting role mid-season, his eighth grade year, and maintained it throughout his 12th grade season. Cooper Ward continued his training at Memphis State University in Idabana, Mississippi. There he obtained his Bachelor of Science degree as a member of the football team. He later became a coach, school administrator, and minister. He currently serves as administrator for the DeSoto County, Mississippi Schools. 
And a gentleman very far in, his name is James Bell, born right here in Helena, Arkansas, and became an all-around athlete playing for the Ravens Negro Baseball League at 15 years of age. He broke records playing baseball and football, becoming a star player on the Eliza Miller Golden Buccaneer team, and as you've heard, the Mid-South is still referees for the little league teams today. So all four of them have had some great knowledge and skills in the field of sports. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read off some questions that I have for them, and uh, the, the, we have to answer any questions. And then at the end, what we're going to do is I'll probably have some of y'all come up if you want and ask questions that you may have interest in. So, and uh, I'll, I'll start off with this question right here. Um, I guess we'll start with this one right here. When did you first realize you wanted to pursue sports goals? And I'll start with Mr. Gaines, and I guess we'll work our way down. First of all, let me say it's, it's good for me to be here. Uh, in fact, uh, I told my wife before I left Jonesboro, every time I get a chance to go back to Helena, West Helena, to be an encouragement to somebody, uh, I want to make sure that I, I'm able to do that. Uh, I was 14 years old, growing up in West Helena. I have my cotton sack here with me. I went, to New I went to New York on a harvest. Mr. John Henry Williams took a group of us to King Ferry, New York on a harvest to pick beans. And we worked in the fields that summer. We worked, we worked, we worked, we worked. And we didn't make any money. And I said, Lord, if I ever get back home, bless me to get back home. I'll go out for football. Basketball, track, baseball, I'll get in the junior choir, I'll join church. I'll do all those things that you just blessed me to get back home. So I was highly motivated. And you can see from one of those pictures over there, I went out for basketball in, in junior high school at Eliza Miller Junior High. And that was just the beginning of, of my career. Uh, I played junior high basketball, senior high basketball. And then, of course, the highlight of my life was when you see a gentleman over there, it's Mike Somerville, who came to West Helena from Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas, and gave me a scholarship. That was my ticket out of West Helena, a scholarship to play football at Philander Smith College in Little Rock. I played there for four years. This is, I don't want to go too far, this is how I got my start. This is how I was highly motivated. When uh, I went out for football and basketball in high school, the coach said, if he said run, I said how fast. If he said jump, I said how high. Because I knew, I knew I was already motivated to, to, to be successful. And I think that when I look back on it, you don't know it, you don't know at the time, but when I look back on it, I had a grandfather who was 97 years old. And he came and he stayed with us. And I can remember excerpts from his prayers. Bless my children and my children's children from one generation to another. And please don't forget about my neighbor's children. And I firmly believe that I'm, I was covered under his prayers because I knew the decisions that I thought I was making were decisions that were already being made for me. So I'll stop there and then I'll come back again if you want to want me to go further into this discussion. Okay, thank you so much and very inspirational. Enjoy hearing that. Uh, and uh, well, I'll, I'll hear from the rest of y'all too. Um, Miss um, Tay, when did you first realize you want to pursue uh, sports goals? Well, me too. As um, my my mentor here uh, to my right, Dr. Gaines. Uh, I first realized that I wanted to um, pursue sports as a career, pretty much, uh, when I was in the ninth grade. So I was about 14 years old as well. Um, growing up in Edmonton, Arkansas, I'm not sure if you all are familiar, it's like 10 miles, uh, 6 miles outside of West Memphis. Uh, I, was, I had eight brothers, two sisters, and I am the, almost the baby. I have a brother younger than me, but above me were five brothers. 
So my sister was a lot older than I was, and um, you know, it, it was growing up with them uh, was a challenge. I mean, they did not want me playing. Uh, I I had to earn my my way on the playground. Um, so you know, but growing up in 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 Edmondson was also it has its, had its challenges as far as you know we we wasn't fortunate to have a lot uh, of money and and we weren't economically uh, wealthy so um, it was it was tough living uh, so if I I knew if I wanted to. Um, get out of the area that I had to do so uh, through sports and it was very uh, I was very driven uh, when I was in the ninth grade and I can vividly remember uh, when I made my goals to become a professional athlete, uh, to go overseas. At the time there was no professional uh, sports in the United States for women. Uh, but I had goals to play professionally overseas. I mean, that was where I was going to be led to. So uh, and those were my goals in the ninth grade. And, uh, you know, while all of the other kids were getting uh, jobs at McDonald's, and, you know, I, I tell this story, but I was just because I coach at Arkansas State University in Mid-South, which is a junior college in West Memphis. And when I tell this story, I just told this story today to two of my athletes that I had in my class, uh, my office, right before I came here. And I'm telling them this story because I'm asking them, what are your goals? What are your dreams? What are the things that drive you? What is your it? And you know, I'm trying to put it in their mind to be driven because you know, no matter what it is. Uh, I'm a firm believer that what, whatever that you want to do in life that you can accomplish. And uh, being a old country girl from West Memphis or Edmondson, Arkansas, uh, it was my goals, my dreams. And, and uh, that's when I first realized when I was in the ninth grade, sitting in the bleachers, talking to my coach and, you know, uh, not one of the star players. Uh, I was just pretty much kind of lost, but at that point is when I knew what I wanted to do, so. Well, thank you so much. Uh, very inspirational, and uh, we'll pass down to Danny Cooperwood. Um, when did you first realize you wanted to pursue sports goals? Well, first, let me say good evening to everyone, and how honored I am to be sitting bookend by these two legendary Buccaneers. <clears throat> it's hard to say when I first received that motivation because I was bequeathed a legacy. My older brother was a 1951 Buccaneer. I heard him talk about Wilbur T. Gaines. I, as an elementary student, I watched James Bell play. I was the, I'm the uncle of an older, older nephew who's a starting quarterback. What did you do if you did not become a Buccaneer in this town? So I was so, and I, and I was drafted by legendary Buccaneer coach Dave Ellis Johnson, who came to my father's house and told my father that younger boy of yours is getting pretty big now. I'd like for him to play football. And Dad had turned me over. So my motivation is is this is what you do when you were a part of this community. You were part of the fabric that was the Eliza Mill Buccaneers. Thank you for that. And uh, Mr. Uh, Bell, uh, what did, when did you first realize you wanted to pursue sports goals? Well, I was uh, just started by saying good evening. And uh, you don't know how proud I am to be sitting on the panel with these people. Uh, I'm not calling you a guy, but you guy, you know the way. But uh, I started, uh, I guess I was seven years old. And we used to pick up those uh, sticks and bad rocks with them. We, we threw more rocks than we batted, but hey, we still did it with all the bangs and the big bang from the head. But, uh, and we used to make us a football out of cotton. Sit there and roll that, that cotton 
So we got it right, and then we make us football. Okay, and if you didn't play football in in a in a them in a Hunter's quarter, them was flat. But I was raised on the south end, so we call it we, we call it the old highway. I was born my house right under the bridge. Call it the old highway. But we had a, a wonderful time, and I'm, I must share this. Uh, when I started playing baseball, I loved it. I loved it so much that uh, when, the, when the guys, the main thing about uh, the black churches, if you didn't go to service, and look, because most of that service started at 11 o'clock, you didn't go to service, you didn't play no baseball after everybody got through. That wasn't going to happen. And the other part about that is the educational part. Uh, it, it didn't only pick up, uh, what, 30, 40 years ago. It didn't only pick up then. It started in me then. I had to make grades. I had to make my grades before I could play. Dad told me, his, and Mom told me, boy, how in the world do you think you're going to play football as small as you are? She didn't have said. <laughs> she didn't have said. Because from then on, I love to hit. I didn't mind getting hit, but I love to hit. 30, 135 pounds soaked wet. I started playing uh, football at uh, Eliza Miller School. Always has been a buccaneer. Always will be a buccaneer. And I would die of Buccaneer. Uh, and I, I just have one other thing to remember. Uh, playing baseball at 15 years old with the Helena Ravens, Dr. James. We would travel everywhere. But we never would make no money. <laughs> we just played for the sports of the game. And we, that Dr. James did both shank for something else with He just opened up everything, and that's, that's where we played our game, the Bochang. But I will tell you this, Helena and West Helena did not want us playing in the Helena Park. We could not play in the Helena Park. Helena Park is that park over, over North Helena, where the swimming pool is. We couldn't play over there. So they built us a park on the south end, down the way I live. We had two down there. And a little league park and a pond league park. So that's what we played. And we thanked them for that because we had a lot of light encouragement. I see you this. We had more white coats on that end than they had on that end. Because they loved to see us play. And a man I would never forget his name, John. Oh, look at how I forgot it already. <laughs> John Glass. John Glass would buy balls, bats, anything you need, he would, he would get it for you. He used to call me Little Campanella. I could sit on my knees and pluck that ball the second day. <laughs> but I didn't like the kids. I wanted to be, you know, the front runner. I don't want to be no kids. But I didn't know at the time, hey, you are the front runner. You got control. But we'll come back to it later. Oh, I, I'll tell you what I did. I'd like to share this with you. I'm still the only second baseman at 15 years old ever hit a home run at MacArthur Stadium. That was the stadium in Memphis. At 15 years old, and my record would never be broken. <laughs> you know why? The stadium. There's no more stadium. It is now known as, as the, uh, <laughs> uh, what is it? Uh, the Auto Zone Park. Okay. Some of y'all may have answered this question a little bit for this first answer, but what were the challenges for you for playing sports in Arkansas? I think the biggest challenge for us playing sports in Arkansas was the uh, kind of limited. Uh, you got, if you get get in the, in the, in the time uh, frame, you have to realize that uh, the opportunity to uh, go to a higher education and play professional sports. The opportunities were there for us, only at Philander Smith in, in this state. 
at Philander Smith and uh, AM and AM College. Uh, so uh, you, you, you're very limited in, in terms of how you could uh, advance your to the, to, the, to the next level in the state. I think that you may have answered that a little bit in your first answer, but uh, what were uh, some of the challenges for playing sports in Arkansas? Uh, I think you answered a little bit in the first Oh, uh, I guess uh, I was talking about uh, with sports playing with my brothers, so it would probably be the only challenges I had, you know, pretty much the biggest challenges I had, you know, just uh, uh, the only female um, that was on the court most of the time. I mean, uh, about 99.9% .9 of the time, I was the only female on the court. Uh, if I wanted to play, I had to play with the guys because there wasn't enough females that were playing to play with. So uh, I guess it was a challenge, but yet, you know, it was a challenge that uh, helped me hone my, my, my skills and get me better. So. I can say that the challenges uh, turned into uh, benefits for me. Uh, so uh, that would be my only challenge. Uh, Mr. Cooperwood, uh, what, what were some of the challenges you faced uh, playing sports in Arkansas? Probably the biggest challenge for me playing sports in Arkansas was an economic issue. Being the son of a mill worker here in West Helen, magnite, plywood, and veneer, and the son of a domestic worker, <coughs> We had to supply all of our basic needs underneath our uniforms, including our shoes. Everything had to be supplied by, if you wanted to play, you had to, you had to supply these things. It was not supplied for us by, by the school district. The, the, the shoes that I have, I'm so honored to have displayed at the, at the center, cost me $25 in 1969. I earned that money working at the Fun Mail Hotel in Omaha, Nebraska with my older brother. And I, I treasure those shoes not only because of the intrinsic value of their memory, but for the sweat equity I had put in the wearing. So the biggest challenge was being able to participate with the needs that you had in order to participate in the sport. Uh, Mr. Bell, uh, uh, what were some of the challenges that you faced? Uh, my uh, greatest challenge was uh, when I started officiating. Uh, I was told that uh, a black man could be a referee. Just couldn't, just couldn't be a referee. He'd be any other referee, but just could not be a referee. So I said to myself, there's something wrong with this picture. So I told Delaney Alexander then, I said, I'm going to be a referee. He said, Dale, he said, are you sure? I said, I'm going to be a referee. I'm going to have my own crew, and I'm going to call some number one games. I did. By the grace of God, I did. I've been all over the, the country, not only as a, 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 a referee, but as a, I, I've been a forerunner, and I'm, I'm proud to be the forerunner. And, and I'm, I, I am glad to have the, the kids and come up and touch me. Said, uh, Mr. Bell. And it just makes me feel so good when you're out to the ballpark and they'll come up and, and touch you. Hey, Blue. Hey, Blue. Hey, Blue. Yeah, I don't mind being called Blue. That's what we call Blue. And they just come up to Walmart and different places. See, anyway, that makes you feel good. That really does. And I just think of all the people that uh, I've called their ball game, including this young man right here. <laughs> I've called Scotty Pippen ball games ever since he was eighth grade at Hamburg, all the way through UCA. I called numerous tournaments and and uh, 4A games, uh, East West games, and uh, at UCA and. Uh, uh, Cedric Houston, Harry McFadden, and I cannot forget Freddie Childress. I cannot forget the Boom Boy. And I'm looking at them, and they're looking at me, telling me, 
high motivated, I'm high, you know, right now in my closet, I have Michael Boone championship, Jack, uh, championship jersey that he played that uh, bowl game in when he was at Ole Miss. In my, in my closet. I also got in my closet my championship jacket from 1964. It's got a lot of blood on it because this day we broke it. No broke and everything, but Mama said, Boy, you going back? I said, Yes, ma'am, Mom. I just love it. When I had the cast on my leg, I was still playing ball. I just love it. So the challenge was that, hey, I overcame. All right. Uh, what are some of your most memorable athletic moments? <laughs> oh, yes, for Mr. Gaines. Sorry, I'm not working with you. Oh, oh, okay. I'll, well, you go. I'll go. I'll go first. Uh, some of my most memorable athletic moments. Yes. Uh, wow. <laughs> I have a lot. Um, I would say some, I mean, obviously, you know, going, getting a scholarship to uh, play at Arkansas State um, and winning uh, the uh, WNIT championship, Women's National uh, Invitational Championship um, my senior year. That was a memorable moment. Um, being in the American Basketball League in uh, 1997, 1998, uh, winning the a world championship with that team. Um, those were uh, some great moments. I mean, uh, but obviously the winning was definitely the uh, biggest thing. But, you know, you look back and you look at all the games and, um, as Mr. Bell talked about how, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears of uh, competition, uh, uh, those were uh, some great moments for me, you know, the, the process. And I, I talked to a lot, you know, my, my athletes about the process, about the rain. Uh, in order to get a rainbow, you got to have rain, you know, uh, going through the rain. Uh, so uh, those were some great moments for me. I had so many, so many great moments. And I would say, first of all, to get a scholarship to play football for Philanderspeel College, that was a great moment. Uh, I was M M MVP for the Gulf Coast Conference, uh, and that was quite an honor because here I am, a little kid from West Elm, Arkansas, the best player in, in, a, in, a, in a particular conference. And then upon finishing Philanderspeel College to be drafted by the St. Louis Football Cardinals to play, uh, to be offered to, to play. And of course, uh, they held my name until time to go to camp and then they released me. And when they released me, uh, another door, window of opportunity opened up. The principal from Mary, the Marion School District came to my graduation and said, I've heard a lot about you. I want you to be my high school coach and, uh, and bas basketball coach and PE teacher. So I went to Marion as the uh, high school basketball coach. And I coached that team for 10 years. And then of course, when Marion, the Marion Spartans and the Felix Tigers of Marion, both in the Marion School District integrated, I became the first head coach for the Marion Patriots. So I'm the godfather of the Marion Patriots and that was, that's quite an honor. Uh, to have been in, in Marion when, when uh, the Cardinals released me, I had been invited to come to the then Boston Patriots as a free agent. But a young lady came to substitute teach. She was 19 years old. And I looked at her and I saw her. And I forgot about football and I forgot about basketball. <laughs> and this past Sunday, this past Sunday, we celebrated our 55th anniversary. So that, that, that was, that was a high, those, those are some highs, because take the sports out of my life, it wouldn't be that. And of course, 
this year, 2016, I was able to give back to Philander Smith College because I have finally discovered that receiving starts with giving. Philander Smith College gave me a scholarship when I didn't know my way out of the building. But to endow a scholarship now, it costs $25,000. So in 2016, 2016, I went back to Philander Smith College and gave back to Philander Smith College $25,000 to endow a scholarship yes. so that some other student could be encouraged to come on. And then, of course, uh, the greatest honor, I was inducted in, one of the greatest honors, I was inducted into the Officials Hall of Fame. And just a few weeks ago, the members of the circle, the first four black faculty members at Arkansas State University, where I was, the, Arkansas State became a university in 1967. I was the first African American student to get a master's degree in health and physical education. I was one of the first four African Americans to be on the faculty at Arkansas State University. This year they had a ribbon cutting and they named four graduate dorms for the first four faculty members at Arkansas State University. And when you go onto that campus, you will see Smith Hall, Strickland Hall, Gaines Hall, and Richmond Hall. Yeah. And that's just, and you'll see a copy of that over there. So I've had some some great moments, and you take sports out of my life, and, and, I, and I'm not too sure that those yeah. things, I, I know that those things will not have occurred. Thank you so much. That was the great things that you've done. Uh, Mr. Cooperwood, um, uh, what are some of your most uh, memorable athletic moments? Well, I have to to do it in form of a personal story. I've had <clears throat> I've had any number of memorable moments as a coach and, and as an educator and other kinds of things. Mine is more personal. It starts with a little story. My eighth grade year. Every Wednesday evening. Coach Dave Johnson would have us to scrimmage in a start in a squad scrimmage, and I had to I had to do his honor at having to be across the line from a senior by the name of Jack Bain, 6'5", 225 pounds of muscle. I'm 13, all of 185 pounds. Coach Johnson would give me instructions, and I'd do everything he said, just like he said. The results were the same though. Jack would wipe me out. Finally, I got fed up. Wasn't going to take it anymore. Some of my emotions and all of my energy and anger, and I lit into Jack with everything I had. And when, I, when Jack got up off of me, I wasn't mad no more. <laughs> but the defining moment that really, that really says about who I am and what I've been as an educator and as a coach and as a sports person came that Friday night following that incident. When Coach Johnson came to me and said, Daniel, you're starting tonight. And I got to do his honor as an eighth grader to go on the field beside Jack that night. And I want you to know I went to work because I wasn't across from Jack anymore. <laughs> I was dry Jack's side. And it kind of, de kind of defines my my memorable moments personally. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Bell, uh, what were some of your most memorable athletic moments? He talked about the big home runs. I'm sure I'll be in it, but well, what were some of yours? Uh, I have only, I guess, I got a, a, a great many. And I say a great many. Uh, because uh, I remember when uh, we first went to a three-man rotation in basketball. Uh, we always had to go to a clinic. So we were in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And uh, we, it was 25 of us there. We had only three blacks out of 25. We uh, had three men crews. And we had the task of working Bobby Knight, Indiana, Nolan Richardson, Arkansas, Dean Smith, North Carolina. 
I said, man, I must be dreaming. First on the court, I was the underneath official. Indiana was playing, I forget who they were playing now, but something happened right under the ass. I just, whoo, I just blew it. Bobby Knight came unglued. Damn! I said, yes, sir. He said, hi. I said, I missed it. He said, come in. That's an old meet me. We met. And he said, Bill, how did you? I said, I just missed the coach. So he turned around. I said, now, you know, as you've been knowing me, I'd never make up a call. He wheeled him back around. And he started back to his bench. I started back to my position. <laughs> and I said, hey, Coach Knight. He said, yeah. I said, stick around. I might miss another one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, shouldn't have been said, but hey. All right, second half, I was a trailing official. Arkansas against, I don't forget who they playing. I was a trailing official, okay? My underneath official and my side official were just completely blocked out from a call, and I made the call. Shouldn't have done that. Nolan came on the <laughs> Bam! My name must be ringing pretty good, you know. So, I said, yes. He said, I thought you told me you ran Terminix. I said, I do. He said, well, the other kind of like you work for Southwestern Bell, you make it all on long distance call. <laughs> so, but in all in all, we had to gray out a 98% on the exam, and a 93% on the tape. We all made it. So that was one of my other memorable moments. All right, thank you all so much for answering your questions, and uh, I'm very inspirational stories from all four of you, and I'm sure that the uh, audience has questions of their own, so uh, we have a microphone set up here. So if anybody has any questions of any of our presenters, feel free to come up and ask them any questions that you might have. I have to go to meeting at seven, but I want to come to repent because when I heard it was going to be a symposium about athletes, me being a person who never had any athletic skills, and having seen my community, in my idea, focus too much on athletics and not enough on life, on, on scholarship. Uh, I had an aversion to it, but I try to stay open-minded and I'm glad I came. Um, part of the reason because I have utmost respect for I don't for the parents. <clears throat> Y'all have inspired me. You have. And I believe in order to inspire other people, you have to be inspired. And I appreciate you taking time out. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you. What I see is not so much athletics. I see people who have fought their way through. And anybody, no matter what your discipline, I'm a lawyer, no matter what your discipline, you know, that's kind of a battlefield too. But whatever, and I, I just want to tell you that you've helped me and I repent for it. It's just good when you have your first thoughts and what you think something is going to be. Uh, there's a quote that I'm going to leave that says, there is a principle that when followed, it will, will never fail to keep a man in everlasting darkness. And that's the attempt prior to investigation. Thank you, all mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kyle Miller, and I, I have a question. What is a common misconception about your sport, about your, you, your life in being an athlete, that something that commonly is misunderstood about what you do? If you could, I take that, anyone can answer that question. I'll, I'll take it first. Um, the common mis misperception uh, about uh, female athletics is that 
uh, we're not good enough or we can't play um, as good as the, our male counterpart. Um, I don't know if how many of you all saw, and actually they're playing tonight as we speak, um, because I played for the WNBA Minnesota Lynx, and they're in the finals against actually my head coach that I played for and one of my best friends that's assistant coach for the Los Angeles Sparks. Uh, I watched that game on Sunday, and, you know, I was very inspired. I saw a lot of great basketball, and... Um, you know, I, I tell my athletes to watch it, and I, I think that if we watch, if if um, if everyone watch, really watch those games, then they will see that there's. I mean, the ball goes in the basket the same way it does with uh, the males. Uh, actually, pretty uh, pretty pretty good. Um, so. I mean, you get the long distance shots, you get the layups, uh, and occasionally you get a dunk uh, there. But I think the, the biggest misconception is uh, that uh, we're not good enough. Um, playing against all my brothers and my cousins, like I said, I played with males, and it made me better. Uh, they made me better. Um, I, I think that another this a big big one is in today's sports is that all uh, female basketball players are are gay or lesbians. Um, that's a big misconception. Uh, but you know, uh, we you 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 have to. That's not the case. It's it's not the case. I mean, I, I'm in a relationship. I've been for. Uh, many, many years, I, you know, there's a lot of uh, great stories in the WNBA, and I think that, that, that people perceive uh, female in sports as being, you know, gays or lesbians, and that's, that's, not, that's not the case, so. One of the things that I've, dis one of the things that I've discovered in, uh, in, in, in athletics is that given an opportunity, when I when I first went to Arkansas State University, when they first recruited me, uh, I was able to negotiate with them. I said, my wife and I have a job in Maryland. I can't come to Arkansas State unless you find my wife a job. They found my wife a job at MacArthur Junior High School. And I'm saying this because I want you to know that we, we want the opportunities. So I went on to Arkansas State, but my going to Arkansas State meant more to Northeast Arkansas than it did to Arkansas State. When we went to Arkansas State, if you lived in Jonesboro, you lived on Washington Street or right on the north side. I lived on the campus of Arkansas State for three years because they, we could not find a place in the city. They would not source a home in a place in the city. So the, the uh, vice president said, y'all can stay on the East College Circle and West College Circle. And this is how we became known as the Circle, because we were one another's support system. But I say this to say this. I wanted to coach, but coaching opportunities were not there for me in, 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 in higher education. But officiating was. So I went to Manila, I went to Paragu, I went to Green County Tech, I went to uh, Marmaduke, all of those places in Northeast Arkansas that had never seen an official of color. And to walk through and you got a, people following you with a camera saying, to taking pictures and the next day in the paper, the first black official that ever worked at Buffalo Island. And these, and at ASU, I was the BSE coordinator and in charge of the coaching endorsement. These coaches that became coaches in Northeast Arkansas went through my program. They said to me, when you come back to referee our games, you can bring anybody you want to bring. I took my daughter, I took Dr. Parchman, the coach at Mississippi State. Uh, I took his wife with me. And the young girl said, this is the first time I've seen a woman official. 
So, so th these are some, these are some things that you know his ways are not our ways. These are some things that opportunities that that, that come about because of changes and because you have the right temperament. You're the, the forty-two or the Jackie Robinson of that time who can put up with stuff. And, and you have to put up with stuff. You have to have a thick skin. And, and uh, James Bell will tell you, as a referee, you cannot let, cannot allow things to penetrate. You, you, you hear it, and it bounces off. So this year, when I watched the finals of the, of the women's, uh, of the NCAA, the NCAA tournament women's, three women officials, and I said, hmm, what if, what if? We had not started giving some woman a chance to represent. It's all about opportunities. And the same thing, and, and I told women, I said, look, you're going to hear things like, get back in the kitchen. You don't have any business on the court. I said, I heard stuff like that. You're going to have to and, and develop a tough skin. You're going to have to treat them uh, like you expect to be treated. I told my wife, who finally became the, the assistant principal at Jonesboro High School, look, if you want to be an effective administrator, you've got to be around administrators, and most of them are men. And I said, she said, but I am not, I am not threatened by any man. I trust you. I don't trust them. You become the best administrator you can be by being around people who have had these experiences. So, so you know, sports can do a lot of things for you, but you have to make sure that you keep things in in the, in the right perspective. Mm -hmm. And if you don't keep it in the right perspective, you think that somebody owes you something. Uh, if you think that I'm so good and I, I did this and I did it, I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. You were put in a position to do something so that you could reach back and bring somebody else. This has been my whole. This has been the one thing that I've always felt like. Give, 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 because receiving starts with giving. That's my position. I'd like, I'd like to speak on that also. One of the, one of the major obstacles in, in, in concerning this image of sports is this question of intellect. We are bombarded with images of the jock who can't do anything but play, can't talk, can't read, can't write, and that is not who sports people are. Sports people are intellectual, they are academics, they are, they are not jocks, and it's a sad situation in this country, in this society, that the only, one that, the only ones that receive any notoriety are those outliers. And some of the, some of the biggest battles that I've had as, a, as an athletic coach and as a school administrator is dispelling this notion that they, they don't have to do. All they need to do is play. And I have constantly, constantly, and, and, and paid a price for teaching children that the biggest classroom on the school, and on the school ground, is this 120-yard field. This is, that happens to be the biggest classroom. You, you got to understand who you are. You, you probably won't believe this story, but one of, one of the biggest battles that I had with, a, with an administrator was about the fact that I was taking my team to the school library before practice every day in order to make sure that they were getting done what they needed to get done. And I got and I ended up in a in a in an administrative fight over that, concerned about what was going to happen to the library. And I literally told him if they tear it up, what are the books for? And I said, here here we've hired educated men to coach these young men in not only in on the field, but they also teach academic subjects. And you don't trust them to impart the academic knowledge that these young men need here in your library. I don't see any good for the library if they can't use it. Of course, you pay a price for being outspoken. The other, the other uh, point that uh, Mr. Cooper would have made that I'd like to uh, elaborate on, uh, ever since that I, I graduated and did the uh, of sports appreciating. You have to prepare yourself first. 
You know, we tell we tell our kids all the time, education comes first and then you can do. A lot of time, is you just saying something. You're just saying something. How can you tell them that when you don't even know what work they're doing in school? You don't know what they're uh, practicing in school. And we make great mistakes. I made them, you made them. Everyone makes mistakes. But you know, I like this point about uh, some of the mistakes that I make. When I'm on that baseball field, I'm the umpire behind the plate. Whether it's T-ball, whether it's pass pitch, whether it's uh, Pony League, or whatever, those moms are right there behind that plate. Said, oh, he called that a strike. Said, Blue, that cannot be a strike. Here, you want my glasses? And the person next to him will tell him, hey, wait a minute. He dealt in both his ears. He can't hear that. <laughs> but that's where you have to be. You have to close them out if you're going to be a good official. Um, James Parks, I want to direct this question to Mr. Gaines, a two-part question. Uh, during your time at uh, Philando Smith, did you ever run into a guy by the name of Elijah Pitts? And uh, the second part of my question is, what happened to football at Philando Smith? Elijah Pitts and I were there at the same time. Uh, of course, he, Elijah, we ran, we, we raced, and he was always one step faster than me. Uh, he was a running back, and I was a wide receiver. And, uh, and I often remind Elijah that I'm the reason he made, made it to the Green Bay Packers, <laughs> because everybody was trying to cover me. So the, after he got through the line, all he had to do was run. So, <laughs> so, so Elijah, but, but there's not a better person in the world than, than Elijah. Elijah was one of the poorest kids. He was so poor, he would have to wash his underwear every night so that he would have clean underwear the next day. But you couldn't find a nicer person. See, and, and Vince Lombardi, he saw that in Elijah. And again, Elijah was not in control, and Vince Lombardi was not in control. Somebody had said to Elijah, if you are a good steward over the gifts and talents that I've blessed you with, I will bless you. And that's what he did. He, I remember Eddie Robinson came on our campus at Philander and got Elijah and took him to Grambling. Coach Somerville went down to Grambling and brought Elijah Pitts back to, back to Philander. And of course, he finished his career. He was at Green Bay when I was after I finished my first year of teaching in Marion, and he kept saying to me, "Come on, come on, you can make it in this league. Nobody can catch a ball like you in this league." But I had met my wife, you know, and I said, "You know, nobody, nobody's gonna change my mind about that." But the more I think about it, I thank the Lord every day that I never made it to the NFL. Elijah Pitts has been dead almost 20 years. The strain and the stress of the National Football League and the injuries. I went to New Orleans to a football game and those guys were getting out of wheelchairs and, 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 the, and I said, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But football is an expensive sport. It's the second part of your question. Football is expensive and, and at Philando, we just can't, couldn't, we just can't afford it. Uh, you know, football is just just too expen expensive. It, pardon me. I believe the last year they had football was 64. 64. I finished in 60. Elijah 61, and I think they had football a couple more years after that. I'm not too, don't quote me on those, those things, but it's just, it's just too, it drains, it drains the institution financially. It drains large institutions financially. 
you know, here we are at Arkansas State. We, we went out and we played Nebraska and we played these big schools so that we can get a big payday and so that we can maintain our program. And we just pay, played UAPB this weekend. They got a big payday so that they could make. But it's just, it's just too, so expensive, so expensive. That's the reason. Well, I just want to um, compliment each and every one of you, and I just want to tell the audience how I found out about uh, Dr. Well, Dr. Gaines and I have a different story, but I don't know if Cal talked about the photograph from the Johnson um, collection, Roger and Johnson collection. We were going through the photographs, and there was this baseball picture. Uh, in there, and uh, I said to my late father, uh, who are these guys? And then um, we looked even a little bit more and saw that there was James Bell in that photograph, and then we, decide, we saw that it was Dr. Gaze. Um, and that was so exciting because uh, I knew little about the uh, Negro Baseball League at the time, but uh, this whole effort evolved from that photograph. That's why it's so important to keep, um, that's why the Johnson Collection is so important because it tells the story of our community. The thing that I want to say is, Dr. Gaines, I was a part, I was at Arkansas State University when um, Dr. Gaines came there, and it is so true. It gives me a chill now to think about how they, meaning Dr. Smith, Dr. Mossy Richmond, uh, Dr. Gaines, and Dr. Strickland nurtured the 1% of African Americans at Arkansas State University in the 70s. I shall never forget how they were our mother, father, sisters, and brothers, even though they were not that much older than we were, and they had their families and their lives but they took very good care of us. It was never a day that we could not go to them and ask for support because we, um, African Americans had been in Arkansas State University, but during the 70s, we were the largest class. So I want to thank Dr. Gaines publicly for what he and all of his colleagues did uh, to support us during that time frame. And I'm so glad I finally get a chance to, to meet up close to uh, <laughs> a female basketball player. Uh, and you're such a role model for uh, other <coughs> girls who are coming up. And the thing that I would like to see happen is that this panel go, uh, will go into our school. And so we need to figure out how to make that happen. In school with uh, Reverend um, Danny Cooperwood, and um, I enjoyed the photographs that were on Facebook. Didn't forgotten that you played basketball. Totally had forgotten that. Just on the team. Just on the team, but you were on the team. And um, his story is remarkable, and I did not know that, that during the days of segregation until tonight that you all were responsible for your uniforms. It gives me a sickness in my stomach, but, but it, it, you know, it's, as the kids would say, it's all it's all good. Um, you know, that story. Children need to to hear that story. And uh, Mr. Bell, uh, when I first heard all the stories with Dr. Gaines and Ollie Brantley, who was another one of the first African American uh, from Arkansas Delta who played, um, who was on a, a national baseball team. Uh, when I heard their stories, uh, I was just, I mean, the video is on Facebook, I mean, it's, it's on YouTube. To hear the stories of how they struggled, but yet were so proud and so courageous uh, to do what they did and how they even intermingled with some of the greatest baseball players. I just want to say thank you for everything. Uh, God bless you, and we need to still get this story told even more. Uh, regretfully, there are not enough people here tonight, but I'm glad we have the video, and I hope that we can figure out something where we can bring you into the schools. And thank you, Kyle, for convening. Well, I certainly feel like it's an honor for 
for me to be here because I know if it, if it had not been for the prayers and the well wishes and the encouragers of West Helena and Helena, I just don't know what would have happened. You know, sometimes I go out to Oak Grove Cemetery and I just walk around through the cemetery and I look at the headstones and I say, there's Mr. So-and-so, there's Mr. So-and-so, there's Mr. so and I can remember how they prayed for me. I can remember how they did this for me. And I can remember how she used to sing, woke up this morning, I said, thank you, Lord. And I can remember those people who did stuff like that. And it's, it's just, you get a joy that you can't get from anywhere else. So if you ever get a chance to go out to Oak Grove Cemetery, you see those new signs. That, well, in our Irvin and I bought those signs. And we wanted to give back, and we want to continue to give back. I just want to give, give, give to West Helena, Helena, every opportunity I get. And, uh, and, and I just feel honored to be able to do that. Anybody have any other questions? All right. Well, I just want to say thank you all so much for coming down. And you really are an inspiration, all four of you. You had some great stories to tell. Thank you so much for taking time out to come down to our symposium tonight. And I, uh, one last thing. Is there anything else that you wanted to say, anything about your athletic careers or professional careers that you think that anybody should know before we end this tonight? I'd like to share my motivation for this, for this walk in sports. And I give credit and honor to, first of all, my father, the most principal man I've ever run across in my life. Secondly, my, my uncle, who taught me the art of war before I read Kun Tzu's Art of War, to Coach Dave Ellis Johnson, who lit a fire in me that rages to this day, to Coach John Lewis Rose, who told me and taught me about the intellect that's in every athlete, to Coach Granville Miller, who inspired social activism in me. I'd like to give honor to those men that I've walked in their paths, and I try to spread who they are, not necessarily calling their names every day, but giving credit and honor to those that went before me and motivated me to walk, walk this path in sports. Also, I'd like to uh, give some shout outs to uh, a young man named John W. White. He was a big man. He was a big man and didn't have to carry a stick. But he always would have something for you. He always would tell you his words were, let him have a do something about this. You got to do something about this, baby. But everybody was his baby. It did not matter. And if you was in trouble and they told you you were going to see Mr. White, you didn't have no more trouble. He had a way of looking at you. Did he not, not gag? Did he not yeah, <laughs> come he, over? He, he had man. a way, I'm telling you, of just looking at you. And everything stopped, just like my father did. When I grew up, I only got one whooping by my father. My mama used to whoop me 36 out of 25 day period. <laughs> but when she said, okay, that's it, I'm going to tell you, Daddy, it stopped. And and I, I tried to instill that in every youngster that I talk, whether it's female or, or male, it doesn't matter. And I always instill in them, you got to have something up here. Not just something, brains. You got to get smarter. If this stool out there goes around and around and around and around, I wonder why it's doing that. How can I make it stop? Put your hand here. It'll stop. But we we all into this right here. We gonna wear out our thongs. That's that's all they into. But it's still that 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Are your numbers? You got to know them. Oh, those are your bases. Never lose your bases. You lose your bases, you lost. You can always go back to basic. And that's that's gonna carry everything uh, on, but I, I won't think of that okay. I, I don't want to say anymore. And I'm just so glad and so proud to be a member of this family. And uh tell me what's tell me, we're still coming. I would like to say this. I think that uh even though we talk about this from a sports perspective, everybody is not given the gift of sports, and, and uh, this is not their gift, this is not their talent. Some have the gift to become carpenters, some have mm -hmm. the gift to become uh, vocational people. Encourage them to go wherever their gift and their talent happen to be. Uh, I had a man come out and work on my, my, my heating, heating air conditioning just Saturday, he worked about 30 minutes, $400. And I always remind young people that you can make a living, and, and this ought to be a goal, make a honest, decent living. And so if it's, if it's a heating and air, or if it's brick mason, or just welding, whatever you get in the town, go for it and be a good steward over it. You don't have to be the, the carpenter forever. You could be the contractor. So there's that if you're good, you can be promoted. So just remind everyone, just remind kids you this size, you're not gonna be a good basketball player. But make sure that you know what your gift and your talent and your purpose in life is. So so. All right. Thank you all so much for coming down and we really had very many inspirational stories from all aspects. Thank you all so much. Give me a round of applause. And thank you all too for coming down and spending time with us.